This was back in my pirate campaign for Pathfinder, wherein we took the disguise for loot, renown, and adventure. For some more details, playing a Kitsune swashbuckler who ran away from home to be a mighty pirate. Our bad egg was playing a wyvern? Like, like this? <laughs> like, like, dude, how do you even... Oh, uh, think medium-sized winged cooler kobolds. Huh, okay. Well, anyway, that person was exhibiting some signs of that boss is mine, but more focused on doing Bloodborne-esque combat. Still as insane as his ladder super grappler giant character as a build was, he was doubly insane as an evil character. He came across rules for rituals and made himself an avaricious creature. Huh, words. That spiked greatly in his power and left the rest of us in the dust, but made him ontologically evil aligned. Now, these templates are a pretty big deal, and since then, we've made our own thematic ones to apply characters at creation. To make it simple, they're a thing that greatly augments the character or creature they're applied to, gives them new powers, comes with downsides. It's great, but it's not so great when the templates makes you evil. Trying to keep up with him wasn't working, so our bad egg decided to push a ritual for my Kitsune to undergo that would make her more powerful by making her a lusting creature, making her ontologically evil, and ontologically horny. It is time, child, for you to claim the power that is rightfully yours. Yes, I have waited for this day for so long. What great abilities will I get? You will soon find out. Yes, please, show me the way. I bestow upon you the infinite might of horny. Wait, what? Forever you shall lust. To bang. Wait, sorry, um, I just don't think that this, uh, works in this particular situation. Why- why not? Do you need me to do the thing? What- what thing? Dude, what are you looking at? We're talking I give someone a look and they drop their items like they're naked. I decided this template was not for me since my character was honorable, good, and a storybook pirate rather than a sex pot. The dungeon master saw I wasn't going for this and decided to have his first custom template ever involving bonds with my sword and the spirit within it. And it became a lot cooler to team up with. I continued my swashbuckling adventures and Bad Egg's character eventually caught the eye of a powerful paladin who fought him to the death and left the rest of us alone which is where we got our super crazy grapple beast from an earlier story. For what I recall, the dungeon master and player did discuss this character death before, so there wasn't much salt involved. Ah, <sighs> the inevitable destiny of all problem players, getting their heads smashed in by a paladin. Maybe not the most noble of ends, but it is a fun one. The story was from a long time ago, back when I was in high school and pre-pandemic. So this happened four or so years ago, back at the latter half of my ninth grade of high school when I was 14. I was playing with a group in person that had its own issues, a story for another day, but I really wanted more Dungeon Dragons. I was playing since I was eight, and this was a very formative game for me. I tried getting other groups in person together, but combined with not really liking the people I was friends with at the time and not having the Game Master bug, I decided to make the doomed decision of going to looking for game LFG on D and D Beyond. When I was a young boy, my father was killed by my greatest enemy. I've sworn revenge ever since. And when I was a young girl, my little brother was kidnapped from our home, and the rest of my family, they were all slaughtered by our rivals. I have been hunting them ever yeah, since. Yeah, well, my family is all good, dude. What? Yep, yeah, they're they're all completely alive. And <gasps> what about you? Uh, um, I. What tragedy happened in your childhood? Yes, we would love to know. Are your parents dead? No, no they're, they're, they're alive, but... But I went through something horrible. I joined LFG when I was 14 years old. I'm so sorry, my friend. I can't imagine the horrors. Yes, we're going to be okay. You're going to be okay, okay. 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 The memories still haunt me. Finding pretty much the first post I could find, I messaged the dungeon master, Jeremiah, and told him I was interested in playing in his game. I didn't get any sort of vet, and he pretty much said, Heck yeah! The party was five people, including myself, plus the dungeon master. I don't remember any of the other players aside from one, Steven. We quickly find out that Steven and I are the only people in this group, DM included, who have ever played role-playing games before, and happily took on helping the other players enjoy the hobby. At least, 
I didn't. I can't say the same for Steven, at least not to be sure. We all build characters. Steven and I help with rules when we can. With myself playing a fire genasi wildfire druid named Kindle, one of my go-to girl bosses. I can't remember the other players. I think Steven was an orcish warlock, and I will accept any and all rewards if that's right. There were a few things that made me a little uncomfortable with the other players, just in the way that they spoke, but I was desperate to play, and Steven was really nice, even collaborating with me on creating our characters, so I decided to stay. And so, the game began. The first session-ish, no session zero, started with the other play- <laughs> Wait, did you say no session zero? Guys, come on! These people are 14, I get it, but still. You guys are killing me, you're killing me! Like, look at this, that's your fault. Every time someone doesn't do a session zero, a crispy dies. Look at that dead body internalize that. Anyway, with no session zero, we started with the other players mucking about on the streets, doing some stuff. I don't really remember as it was a while ago, but eventually Steven and myself were introduced walking into the tavern. Now, I really like playing Kindle as an out there, takes no craps fire girl. So the next thing she does is walk up to the bar and ask for the hardest thing they've got while also talking to her traveling companion. After Steve and I interact a little bit, the Dungeon Master describes the bartender passing me a shot. Naturally, I slam it down. Dungeon Master calls for a constitution save. Me thinking that's some real hard stuff, I roll it and I fail. The Dungeon Master rolls some dice and tells me I take about half my hit points in poison damage. I was a little stunned and just said something along the lines of, what, kind of chuckling because I'm trying to get the joke. The Dungeon Master explained that you asked for the hardest stuff, that's poison. Give me some of the hard stuff. <sighs> Dang. Steven was the first to speak up, and him and I tried to gently guide him away from that extremity, as I clearly meant alcohol, and he waved it away and tried to laugh it off and moved on. We moved towards the bounty board, deciding to move on with what the dungeon master had prepared, and saw one with a very, very high reward for finding a lost cat. Finding it a little funny, we also wanted an easy job, so we took it. Following the bounty to get some info, we went across a very strange older woman. She spoke in this hag of the bog sort of voice, saying, please, will you find my cat? And we understandably freaked out. No matter how many skill checks we rolled, however, we could not get any additional information. <laughs> it's like when Baldur's Gate 3 tried to convince me that this lady was just some old woman on the road. I know what you are, woman! We decided, screw it, let's go. We accept the bounty proper and follow some tracks of the forest. Succeeding on a few skill checks, we eventually come into a lake and a chimera lands in front of us as the old woman says, Oh, there you are, and the dungeon master us to roll initiative. We were all at level one at the time, and so Steven and I are messaging each other about how this was all a little slapstick, but it'd be fine, it's a more lighthearted game, plus we enjoyed our characters, so we were like, heck yeah. However, scheduling conflicts arise, and Dungeon Master wanted to do some prequel-esque stuff, giving the party members extra stuff, with the only thing being a hippogriff egg. And over text, gave the other characters a succubus girlfriend with whom the last message I saw before noping out of there was them intimidating her. Oh, and apparently someone had a child with her? They also got a unicorn and a flame tongue sword and such before the game even really started. Steven decided to try and convince the Dungeon Master to lay off a bit with this high-level loot. Also the succubus crap, right? Cause that ain't passing the sniff test. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Dude. It stinks. We decided to give it one more shot and stay for another session. Another bevy of super pushed magic items, not to mention between a ridiculously high damage dagger and the flame tongue sword, it just trivialized my fire damage. And this demon child having magic and a plus 11 to persuasion, which is higher than a succubus, this all culminated in the two of us deciding to talk to Dungeon Master and agreeing and saying no D&D is better than bad D&D. After confronting the DM, we both went over the problems we had with the game and why we were leaving. We recommend he focus more on what the other players want. If they do want the power fantasy style game, then we'd be more than happy to help with any encounter design or NPC acting he might need. Departing the call, we lamented how we didn't like being mean to new DMs, but it was important to say. Steven, pretty much along with us confronting the DM, decided to start a Pathfinder game using the Curse of the Crimson Throne module, and invited me to play in it, saying he enjoyed playing with me. I did feel bad for the DM though, and invited him to the game. <laughs> He accepted, saying he'd be happy to see a more experienced dungeon master in action. Thus begins the journey of the elf witch, human war priest, and old DM's human bard, and my kitsune swashbuckler. Again, I was 14. 
plus 14, okay. The game was very fun, especially with the War Priest and Witch, though our old Dungeon Master was developing into something of a problem player who could have seen that coming. No matter how much DM tried to help him, he didn't learn his character and got distracted by shinies. He never focused during games, having music and anime playing in the background during our games, meaning our Dungeon Master had to tell him to quiet down during many of our sessions. This culminated in him jumping down a hole going after a ringing ambush by some baddies that were down there, dying before we could help him out. He made a half-orcish monk after that, but we quickly realized he was playing games and not at all focusing on the game, not losing any of his abilities this time, and just generally bringing down the mood for everyone, finally causing the DM to just kick him out. It's a much more mundane horror story, but I feel people who've done LFG games can relate to this one. This was a really long time ago, and I only have some Discord messages to go off of in writing this, so I'm sure I've left some stuff out, but the story does have a happy ending. I stayed with this group ever since then, and we're going on four years now. They've been super supportive to me and have had to put up with a lot of my crap as I got older, and I love them to bits. We're going to have our fourth, fifth, and sixth game. Thanks. Hey dude, don't thank me, thank them. Finding people in this world who can help you out, who got your back, that's valuable, you know? It's really good. I understand wanting to give this guy a second shot, especially since, yeah, this isn't the worst horror story I've ever heard in my life, but this Dungeon Master definitely doesn't know how to run a game. Though, I will say, you are right. It doesn't necessarily mean they don't know how to play a game. There are plenty of players out there who would be awful DMs, and that's okay, by the way. Two different roles requiring, oftentimes, two different skills. DMing requiring, in my opinion, at least, a lot more skills. Though, in my opinion, it's just not a risk I would be willing to take. Though, I think I'm also a very not nice person sometimes, so honestly, I respect the heck out of you for seeing that this guy could be a good player. The best part of this horror story, in my opinion, is the mature conversation you had with the new Dungeon Master. You understood the guy was new, you understood that he made mistakes and that they needed to cut out, but you also understood this game simply may not be for you and decided to, in a mature fashion, walk away, which is really nice to see. Bit of a new guy to the channel, but I'm enjoying the video so far. Now onto the story, this is about 10 years ago now, and it just so happens to be my first ever game of Dungeons & Dragons. First, I need to provide a little bit of context. I'm vision impaired, and one of my friends, at the time, who knew I was struggling not being able to see well enough to play my video games anymore, invited me to join his group. Dude, my life is regularly brought to a screeching halt just because I lost my glasses. my glasses? Ow! Oh! Oh my- Seriously, where are they? Ugh, where could they possibly be? Are you fu- So yeah, gotta say, respect the crap out of you. Look, friend invited me and all in all, we have five players plus our dungeon master. I knew only one other person at the table and might have seen the DM's friend's cousin once or twice. I'm obviously new to the game, so my friend and I sit down to come up with a character. I think I settled on a dwarven paladin, though don't recall the backstory at all. We get to session zero and everyone seems pretty cool. The dungeon master starts looking over everyone's character sheets, turns to me and says, Hey man, your sheet is wrong. You forgot to include that your character's blind. I tried to say I didn't forget the character just, you know, isn't blind. But the Dungeon Master says, no, you're blind, so your character's blind. That's the rules. It's obviously my first time playing, so I take him at his word and we move on. Wait, hold on. Why can't I use a bow and arrow? It's an essential part of my kit. Look, you can't use a bow because I've never seen you use a bow. That's just how it works. Wait, you're saying that everything that we are, our characters need to be, that's just absolutely ridiculous. I mean, baseline, that means most of our characters can't do anything because I don't know if you know this, but we're all just normal people here. <sighs> I think it's perfectly reasonable for a DM to expect that players be just as good as their characters. I mean, yeah, I get that you're a normal person, but I can't say the same for everyone else. What about that guy? He's playing an ancient dragon god. Is he an ancient dragon god? Okay, look, exception to the rule, okay? I am a little annoyed thinking my first friend neglected to tell me I would have to play a blind character 
but I make some joke that at least the roleplay will be easy. We start getting introductions, generic ass characters make their entrance in whatever way they think suits their character, and we get to my turn. I describe how my character, eyes clouded over, walks confidently through the door to his favorite tavern to go straight to the bar, but orders a drink before hanging to the table he knows is seeking adventurers. The dungeon master steps in to ask me to roll a d20. I don't remember the specific check he was asking me to make. Ten years is a long time after all. Now, I think this is odd, but no one else has had to roll during their introduction, but again, figure, whatever, it's probably just some other rule. I don't know how, but I roll well. I don't remember the exact number, but it was definitely more than like 15. With a laugh, the dungeon master narrates how my character trips on his way into the tavern, breaking one of the doors off in the process and goes sprawling into the middle of the room. Damn, how chonky is this dwarf? You know how much door hinges can hold? You ain't breaking those off with a tumble, man. The dungeon master then cuts off my friend partway through him, narrating that he goes over to help, saying your character wouldn't do that, even though my friend was playing a cleric. Said friend then immediately both insist that his character would do that, and that dungeon master should explain why my role wasn't good enough to succeed on whatever check he was making me do. Dungeon Master responds, he's blind. Some people can't do things. He needed a nat 20 to succeed. He was rewarding my good role by not having me break my neck in the fall and dying. That quickly turned into an argument, which ended the session and that group. Yeah, that's for the best. Look, if the Dungeon Master doesn't think they can handle a person with a disability in their Dungeon Dragons group, fine. It's their group and they know the limits of their skills. But this immature way to handle the situation is utterly ridiculous. Obviously, people don't need to play characters exactly like they are. We made the whole skit about this, so I'm sure you already get the point. But I have seen in the past people do a similar thing with more noble intentions. Like, oh, you're gay, or you're a certain minority, or you have this disability. Your character must have those same things, not out of malice, but just because they genuinely believe that. But that's not always going to be the case. For example, I'm asexual. I'm not always going to play asexual characters. There's also an air of gatekeepingness to this one, like blind people don't belong in D&D, &D, and it should go without saying, but that's pretty dumb. I have a handful of horror stories, but the one that's been generally grinding my gears lately is a former dungeon master of mine. Both of us met and started playing together in college, and we're still friends today. It has become abundantly clear over the years that our playstyles are... Not cohesive, however. The biggest red flag can date back all the way to the first game he DM'd, a Pathfinder homebrew game. That campaign was a mess in its own right, problem players, unbalanced fights, one of the players moving away and then never coming back, but it was his first time DMing and we were all still pretty new, so I can give the benefit of the doubt to a lot of it. I was playing a charisma-based character at the time. I can't remember the class, it's been years, and one thing he had mentioned I still remember is that he could no longer make diplomacy an option because my character was too good at it? Dude, can you imagine if video games work like this? Like you invest all this time into getting max net running skills in Cyberpunk, or maxing the levels on your Baldur's Gate 3 bard, and the moment you get to max, you're banned. <laughs> I think the reviews for those games would be slightly worse if that were the case. Fortunately, my character was also decent at fighting, so I let it go, but it just always rubbed me the wrong way. Small things like that just kept adding up. While I don't slouch on making cohesive characters, I enjoy the role-playing and stories that D&D &D and other tabletops can get me. The Dungeon Master goes in another direction, preferring numbers going up and min-maxing to make sure he can handle anything without the rest of the party even this is especially bad when we're playing together as he's just itching for the next fight to outpace the rest of us while i'm talking to npcs making allies and you know engaging in the world i'm not saying how he plays is wrong but it doesn't gel with some of the other players at the table we had three heavy role players and another player who while also mostly enjoying character building and fighting, still participate with the entire party. Fast forward to last year, we had just wrapped up a game another player had DM'd, and friend wanted to get back in the Dungeon Master seat again. We thought, sure, the one-shots we had done were decent, and despite some headbutting last game, we were sure he would put that behind us and start anew. The pitch was that there were odd things in this world not making sense and going awry. Wait, like what? Since when do things in fantasy make sense? Anyway, for these things going awry, a guild was set up to solve this larger mystery. We were encouraged to make different characters from all over and he would incorporate them. 
After my high of playing my very tired dad, Cleric, I rolled up a paladin and went with a bit of an opposite direction. He was young and significantly less sure of himself due to having to fill in some big shoes left via his hometown hero parents. The place he came from was a very small country that had just opened its borders to the rest of the world. Other players included a barbarian, amnesiac, run by a very fun roleplay heavy guy, monk who was a mute plant-based character, very creative ways to incorporate a more stoic player, wizard, childhood friend of paladin, and our third heavy role player, and rogue, friend of barbarian, new to dungeon dragons, not much of a backstory. The first few sessions were fine, not great, as the party never really had a moment to you know, set up a dynamic, but it was decent enough. We managed to stop a minotaur and some cultists, went to a secret society with some genuinely cool world building. Our wizard loved it. But Dungeon Master seemed frustrated that they did so much, implying they should stay and roll a new character? It really is great to hear that you enjoy my homebrew and the world I've built, man. Yeah, I mean, you deserve it, man. I just think that there's just one thing I need from you. Oh, of course. I need you to retire your character. What? 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 Retire your character. Whoa, dude, okay, chill out. There, I, I don't know why I would... Retire your character now! Oh, okay, okay, okay. I, I, I'll, I'll retire my character. Oh my God. Okay, great. Thanks for your feedback. What? Then things started going squirrely. There was this minor thing that was pointing us to the main story quest, and when our players thought that this is too big for our britches after some very low rolls and bad luck, we decided to make a strategic retreat and form the higher level DMPCs running the guild that they could handle it. This is why you don't have those in the game. This really confused the dungeon master, but he has a history of bad scaling, so the party decided to play it safe. Then the big thing. We had avoided dealing with some bandits. This had consequences. They had captured some people from the guild, one of which was an NPC the DM added from my and Wizard's backstory, a friendly face and a bit of a rival. Wizard and I were particularly incensed. We wanted to get our buddy back. Our party was explicitly told to try and get the NPCs back without handing over the gold for a ransom. We head out, run some bandits, and after a skirmish, Paladin decides to talk to them. Despite being handily defeated and myself rolling decent diplomacy, these guys are not budging. But they did budge to my intimidation, an act that I had stated in and out of game my Paladin disliked using. Boy was strong, stronger than most, but he didn't like to throw his weight around. He felt his strength should help lift people up or serve as protection, not force others to do what he wanted. You and I play intimidating characters very differently. Think you can stand there and bark orders at me? Fuck the fuck off! Um, I'm in, um, please make your way to the exit. It was a small thing, maybe nitpicky on my part considering everything else, but it just rubbed me the wrong way. We continue to their main encampment, and it's just this whole fort. A sealed shut, military equivalent fort filled to the brim with enough enemies to have round the clock sentries on all sides. We ignored what we were told were low level bandits for just four weeks. We managed to make a huge distraction outside thanks to some scrolls we picked up to sneak in, making it seem like the fort was under attack. Our hope was to find the NPCs and just get out of there, so we were just looking for a map of the place. We never found a map, but we did find the holding cells, which had not a single person in them. Instead, there was a snarky letter from the leader of the encampment asking if we were done playing games. We were told to meet him outside. The party figured it was a trap, so we schemed to figure out how we could get away with the NPCs and the money like we were told. We came up with a plan to give Paladin the money, show it to the leader, and act like we were negotiating. Heck, even pretend to sweeten the deal. His family had money, switching places with them and even holding him ransom would likely catch a prettier penny than the guild. While arguing this, our rogue would sneak back, unbind the NPCs, and hopefully get the heck out of there, doing as much damage to the place as we want. Everyone agreed, and we thought, hey, this is a good plan. We go out there, rogue, already doing the sneaky thing, and after my paladin states his offer and I was going to roll, one of the NPCs just gets shot in the head and is killed. Wow! A perfectly reasonable, logical, and peaceful way to solve the dilemma your party are currently in! Yeah, I, I think we did a really good job planning this out. <laughs> Let's move on now. There is no stated way to stop this and only seems to serve as punishment for Paladin trying to negotiate. 
The leader says he knows who I am, which I haven't told anyone, not even my own guild, and he doesn't care. Other powers are at play, blah, 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 and a fight breaks out. Five enemies versus our five party members. I swear those enemies had character levels because that fight sucked. And that in character design sucks too. Seriously, for the love of God, stop using character creators to make monster stat sheets. Player characters and monsters are different things. Learn how to make proper monsters and you will not regret it, I promise. Anyway, yeah, fight sucked. Wizard was blocked from doing spells, Monk got the crap kicked out of them, Barbarian and Rogue got some decent hits, but as soon as those enemies were at half health, they teleported away. As for me, I was the furthest away without my mount, so I couldn't even get a hit in before the battle was over. I was relegated to heal bot as a paladin. It felt like nothing was accomplished. The character moment Wizard was trying to set up with me was even shut down by an NPC that was supposed to be an old friend. Barbarian was particularly bitter and asked what the point of this fight is at all. Everyone at the table felt really salty that night. I set up a little group text excluding the DM to ask if that session felt crappy to anyone else. Rogue did not see the issue, but everyone else had a huge problem with it. Monk, our other numbers guy, hated how unfair that fight felt. Barbarian was pissed that we went in circles. Both he and Wizard were mad about how casual the DM took to murder the NPC. They weren't known, but it was still our party's job to get them safely back. When we mentioned that, the Dungeon Master just mumbled that it was almost like we were in a world where people could be raised from the dead no problem, as if True Resurrection, a spell no one the party had, could solve all of our problems if we died. We decided to sit down and explain what went wrong. Even state we're okay to do that over. But halfway through, the dungeon master just shut down, looked at his phone, sullen that we didn't like what happened at all. When we asked what we were supposed to do, he asked why we didn't just hand over the money. The money we were told explicitly to keep. Oh, another DM habit I despise. Seriously, if you think something is a dumb idea or a bad idea, the first psychology ain't gonna work on your party all the time. You're not being clever, you're being stupid. What are you? An idiot sandwich. I see this so much. Stop it. The game ended after that. We have not played with that group since. Barbarian has sworn off of tabletop role-playing games entirely, even. Monk has offered to maybe try setting up a game, but everyone else has been really dodgy about it. I didn't go into it, but Dungeon Master was really crappy to Wizard in that game too, shutting down everything and anything they came up with. I did think their character was a bit hyperactive, but TM went way too far with it. They didn't want to play something like this with him ever again, and frankly, neither do I. It's a shame because I really like my paladin, but the sting of that game has made me nervous to trust a Dungeon Master with him again. Certainly not this Dungeon Master, at least. Wizard and I have started a new group of some friends from my work. We're currently playing Curse of Strahd. It's been a blast. Everyone loves their characters and like how Wizard is DMing. As for our former Dungeon Master, well, he took that world to another group, and from what I heard, it's been a mess. He's done nothing but complain. Some criticisms are valid, but others could have been solved with a session zero. No, really? or him saying no to character ideas. Sometimes when we talk about our games, he brings up the idea of playing with us again, like old times. I laugh it off, but I'm seriously unsure if he's even aware how badly he burned that bridge. One of my favorite quotes in media of all time comes from True Detective season one. People incapable of guilt usually do have a good time. My friends, do not underestimate the power of blissful ignorance. A little bit more apparent than most times, but it is something that is present in the vast majority of our horror stories. You're right, this person is not a good dungeon master, but skill and not being a good dungeon master are not always necessarily tied. Like, obviously, you can be an unskilled dungeon master, but a truly bad DM, a horror story DM, well, a big criteria that I see often is an inability to internalize criticism and an inability to improve at all. We've all gotta get better eventually, but somebody who genuinely thinks that they've got no room to grow, who doesn't want to grow, who doesn't want to listen, yeah, not conducive to being a good dungeon master or a good person. Hey, that's a wrap. If you guys enjoyed, then please do leave a like. If you want to see more of our content, then you can check out our Tavern Adjacent D&D podcast. We've got some cool guests coming up, so you can catch up on the old episodes. It's linked in the cards. And while you're there, subscribe to Crispy's Tavern to get more of our content as it comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own stories or thoughts, go down in the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment, better than bad D&D, to let me know you made it to the end of the video. Hey, by the way, if you have your own horror stories, you can send them directly to us. There's an email down in the description down below, send your stories our way for a chance to be featured in one of these videos. But hey, even if you don't have any stories, in essence, like, comment, subscribe. I will see you all next time.
farewell. Thank you.